Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining me on the third evening of the ACCA Strategic Business Leader Practice to Pass webinar series. Um, thank you again. You know, it's, it's absolutely wonderful to see a few familiar pair, well, familiar names, should I say, in the attendees uh, tab. Um, just to make sure you can all hear me and a little bit of formalities again, if people have either logged in for the first time or not logged in before, um, just let me know you can hear me by putting a yes or a Y or even a pleasant greeting into the question panel and I'll keep an eye out for that to make sure that you can hear me. Uh, Farkan, Aisha, Paul, uh, Mahmoud, Sanika, Nasir, lovely to see you all again. It's absolutely fantastic and I'm uh, really looking forward to this evening's session. Thank you, Erica, Tega, and Atika. Wonderful. Um, so it's good to be back indeed, Erica. And um, hopefully this evening you'll be looking forward to uh, an engaging evening. So I can see already, um, is there a Kahoot? Wow, I must have gone down really well. Yes, there will be a Kahoot this evening. Uh, but we're just going to sort of move through this evening um, a slightly slightly differently. We'll probably do that later in the evening to keep us awake. I appreciate that Wednesday is the middle of the week for the majority of people. Um, it's actually slightly um, slightly different out in the Middle East. So in Dubai and in the United Arab Emirates and in other countries as well, like Oman and the other parts of the Middle East, our working week is a Sunday to a Thursday. So Wednesday for me is like the Thursday for the most normal people, or for, for the normality of other, other regions. Um, but don't worry, I'll still be here tomorrow and on Friday. So um, well done for everybody who's got to the middle of the week. We are significantly more successful than we would be if you weren't here. And um, I can see the numbers ramping up in the attendees, which is really encouraging to see. So with no further ado, I'm going to click on through the, the PowerPoint, the presentation, and talk you through what we're going to be doing this evening. And hopefully you guys will be able to help me as we go along. And as promised, there will be a quiz there will be a Kahoot, um, so hopefully you can look forward to that. Last night, um, we went through and we looked at RailCo, which was specimen paper two, and we commenced with our exam walkthrough. And within that, we did a walkthrough of the exhibits and an introduction. We dissected requirements one and two, and then we did an answer plan for each section of questions or requirements one and two. And it was a really good way of getting to understand how to attack these requirements and break them down into more manageable chunks. This evening, it's more of the same, uh, but we're going to be taking on questions three, four and five. Um, and then we're also going to be engaging with a little bit of uh, feedback that I've had from some students and give some overview. I remember yesterday uh, there was an individual, I think it was John, hopefully John's on this evening, and I'm sure it relates and it'll be helpful for you all, uh, asked me to look at things like internal controls. And I'm also going to give you some exam techniques specifically on how to develop your points, because I don't think any of you were necessarily struggling with thinking of things to put in your answer plan. But you maybe were thinking, well, how can I get that to be regarded as a, a worthwhile comment or a worthwhile point to actually gain marks? So I'm going to show you an exam technique and a way of structuring your paragraphs and sentences to try and maximize your mark allocation, which hopefully you will find useful. So let me just have a quick look, see if anything's popped up in the question panel that's urgently needs dealing with before I get started. Um, and I don't think there is. No, nope, everyone's just happy to be here, so fantastic, uh, including me. So where to start? Developing your point. One of the techniques I used to teach all my students and continue to teach all of my students, and it's actually one that's transferable across most of the strategic professional level, is a technique whereby we need to consider how to develop the point. So this, this little line here, uh, up to two marks, we're often available for well-developed points, comes from every single examiner's report that I've seen. And I'm going to show you what I mean by the term, so what? Uh, I was having a conversation today with a student who's on the uh, Practice to Pass webinars. And uh, I said to them, this, this phrase, this terminology, so what, is not necessarily the most professional way of trying to get my point across. It's not the most professional language. But if we put that to a side for a second and they try and empathize with why I use that, 
Um, I use the term so what because it's short, effective and easy to relate to. And when I'm trying to teach students and I'm trying to get you to understand what I'm saying, I will make sure that I put it in as simple terms as possible. So whenever you're writing something, you're writing your point and you're thinking, how do I need to develop it? Think, so what? And to do that, I use the acronym PEC. And I visualize a woodpecker uh, in your exam um, and when I'm writing down my answers to try and sort of think about that. So it's quite telling, and you might be able to hear this, that little pecking noise. And that's me trying to get you to hold on to what a peck is. It's, it's that little niggle in your answer where you're thinking, have I expanded as much as I possibly could? And to do that, many students are fantastic at getting the points. And I'm going to give you some examples. And then they forget to do the other two parts, which is to expand and comment. When you put your point, you are effectively stating a key issue which you have identified in the case. And we'll give examples as we go along. When you expand, you're explaining that why is this an issue or why you have identified this point. So you're explaining, you're going further, you're expanding. And that might get you the one mark or maybe you know half a mark, the first little two parts. But where you'll actually get more marks and you'll get the, the full quantity of the two allocated per well-developed points is your comment. And your comment is going to be a link relating to the impact on the case study and scenario. If I give you an example from Railco, and this specifically relates back to question or requirement 2B, and we say the point around their internal controls issues. Now, uh, John, you talked about internal controls. You asked me to talk a bit more about internal controls. So this is where I'm coming in here with this. Your point was that there was a 40% of stations which do not have ticket barriers. All right. And loads of students saw that. In fact, I think everybody did. When you read the scenario, you're looking for internal control problems. That was one that jumped out to most people. Hang on a minute. Loads of stations don't have barriers. And if I was to put that on my answer paper and leave it there, you would probably score half a mark. But that's not good enough because we're looking for more than that. And we're looking to really squeeze out the most for the points that we have found in the actual scenario. So to expand upon that, I then go further to say this has led to more fraud on rail car trains as the passengers are not paying for their tickets. Okay, so we've expanded, and it's you know it's better than just having your point. If you said, okay, this is actually an explanation of the point, and you might get maybe another half a mark for that expansion. But where you really gain some more credibility and you get the overall two marks would be where your comment comes in. This is the big so what. So, so far we've said 40% of stations do not have ticket barriers. This has led to more fraud on the rail car network as passengers are not paying for their tickets. The comment is, as a result, this will lead to a significant reduction in revenue. So hopefully, and I wouldn't mind a little bit of confirmation from your guys or from, from in the question panel, hopefully you can see how I'm pecking along. Do people see how that's working? Wonderful. Yeah. So I've got a bit of got a bit of uh, confirmation that you see how the pecs working. And I want to show you how this translates maybe into a more continuous prose and how I'd like to see it structured. So what I'm looking for as a marker is effectively a student going through, pecking their way through the exam. So, you know, just tapping away, making sure that they actually are answering. So that point, expand, comment. Every time you make a point, expand upon it and then comment on it. And it can be in very, it doesn't need to be one thing. It doesn't have to be just revenue. It can be related to costs. I think Nasir mentioned something about costs in the question box, which is brilliant. And what I'm really thinking about with the comment is that you are training and studying towards being chartered accountants. So that comment, to some extent, wants to relate back to necessarily what a chartered accountant or a strategic business leader with a, a chartered accountancy qualification would be thinking. So it could be that the reduction in costs is what you put, or, or reduction in revenue is what you put, or it might be an increase in costs as a result of 
increased overheads per passenger. If you were to write this out in your answer, I would want to see a subheading. And I really can't emphasize this enough, and I know I'm going to continue to do it, but passengers without tickets, underlined, guides me as the marker and really helps me understand what you're about to say. And in times of pressure and in times of stress in your exam, these headings really do add a lot of weight and a lot of value and professionality to guiding the reader and helping ensure that you cover all the major points. So within your answer, you could expand upon that PEC. So you could go along the lines of it. It's been highlighted over the last two years that Railco believes that a significant number of passengers are traveling on Railco's network without tickets. An internal control or a key internal control weakness would appear that there are approximately 40% of Railco stations that do not operate ticket barriers, allowing the potential for customers ticket fraud. This potentially will have seriously damaging consequences on the performance of Railco in that revenues are not being optimized. Now, that's the type of thing that would definitely pick up the majority of the well-developed point marks. In fact, all of them, because it comes straight from the actual model answer. And hopefully, now you've seen me break it down in a PEC point of view, it becomes a little bit more relatable, a little bit easier to grasp. Um, Saji, does it does a spelling mistake make you lose marks? No, it does not. Um, as long as it's particularly, you know, as long as it's not massively ridiculous, um, the the marker will do all they can to try and give you the marks. At ACCA, we we have a, a policy of positive marking. We do not negatively mark. So if we can try and find a way to give you the marks, so for example, if you've got a small spelling mistake in there, it's really not the end of the world. But what I would say is try to get in the habit of not, but understandably, you may, I know I, I often spell things incorrectly, like I think I did last night on my presentation. But it's not the end of the world, it doesn't mark you down, it just may possibly implicate on professional marks if it's consistently bad. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Wonderful. Um, so I'm glad you said it's very helpful. Ah, fantastic. Nasir, you're already jumping the gun, which is not a bad thing. Maybe I should change it. You're already ahead of the, head of the game. Nasir's already throwing other internal control issues. Uh, Nasir, we want you to pack. And the one that you stated, which I believe, um, was a lack of investment on online ticket booking systems. So Sealand and ANR have invested in both online booking systems. That's your point. And then you're thinking, all right, nice one. So what? And then you expand. You explain how that happens to be a problem for Railco or the implications and the surroundings of Railco. So Railco lacks an investment or and or and or development in IT. So we're expanding. We're going further. We're saying, right. Sealand and ANR have actually both got online booking systems. Railco doesn't. This represents a lack of investment or development. And the comment, this will hamper long-term performance of the business. So you've done your peck again, point expand comment. How does this translate? Well, I would want to see a subheading noted, lack of investment in online booking systems, and words to the effect as follows. A further internal control weakness could be seen as the lack of investment in online booking systems. Several other national train operators offer online booking facilities and evidence suggests that this has positively impacted upon the revenue growth and customer satisfaction in all of these businesses. And they even reference the appendix that it's come from. So they're saying appendix three which is fantastic. So they're referring to the exhibit where they found this information. And you are more than welcome to do that in your answers. It is quite a nice way to strengthen some of your answers and expand upon them. Then they talk about the lack of focus upon IT and investment, IT investment and development is a key strategic information system uh, in the key strategic information systems could be seen as an internal control weakness and could hamper the long term performance of Railco. So we've pecked our way through another internal control issue. And this approach, the PEC, doesn't just specifically relate to internal controls. You can do it for um, an evaluation of a strategy. You can do it on pretty much any type of answer. 
So what I've tried to do there is give you a nice way for those students who struggle to write more, to give you a nice way of thinking about how can I write more? I know what I want to write. I have the point in my head. I've done my answer plan, but I'm not sure how to go further. Well, when you want to do that, you want to peck. So subheading, underlined, state your point, expand that point by explaining what you mean and how it, protect, how it potentially has a, a sort of a ruffle effect within the case study and then comment on that and link it back to the implications potentially around performance. So that brings me to the end of talking around PEC. Hopefully you found that useful. I know many of you engage with it, which is really nice to see. And um, it's just some of the little sort of gems that I hope would help students expand their answers. Oh, John, I can't believe it. We've been talking about you and you've only just logged on. Um, John, it was I was talking about an approach to expanding and developing your points within your answer. Um, for the benefit of everyone, I'll just do a quick summary because bear in mind, John was the one who inspired this because it focused predominantly around internal controls. So you get your own little shout out. Um, John, hopefully you can see this. So you get up to two marks for developing your points, well-developed points, and this is something that's consistent in all marking schemes and consistent within the examiner's reports. The framework I use, PEC, Point, Expand, Comment, is where you identify a key issue in the case. So this, when we're talking about internal controls, will be the internal control weakness. You then expand by explaining why it is an issue, and then you comment by linking the impact back to the scenario. And the one that I'll go through quickly is that there is 40% of stations that do not have ticket barriers. That would pick up some credit. You expand by saying this has led to more fraud on the network of Railco because passengers are not paying for the tickets. And then you comment and you talk about the implication. And the implication here is as a result, this will lead to significant um, reduction in revenue. And then if you structure it within your answer, I'd want to see a subheading, passengers without tickets, and then written in a continuous format like below, so several sentences in a nice professional manner, and that will pick you up the two marks you're looking for. Similarly, I did a walkthrough of a PEC on Sealand and ANR and their online booking systems. I expanded by saying that Railco did not invest in IT, and my comment was that it would hamper the long-term performance of the business. Again, I'd want to see a subheading stating your points, so a lack of investment in online booking systems, and then your PEC underneath, your point, your expansion, which is your explanation, and then your comment, which is the impact on the performance of Railco. John, that's what PEC is. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Hopefully that's helped. I appreciate it was a bit of a whirlwind. Um, before I move into the requirement, cheers, John. Uh, before I move into the requirement three, I'm just going to have a quick look and see if there's anything I can help with in the question box. Um, so here we go. I'm just going to go silent while I read it. So please don't think I've ran off. I certainly haven't. Um, so... Ortega's asking, would it be out of line for our comment to address the strategy? No, not at all. Um, your comment is very flexible to some degree. So as long as your comments related back to the question, the requirement. So one thing I will say is that the PEC is a very flexible way of expanding answers. And therefore, your comment can be flexible in terms of as long as it's addressing the requirement. So if you want to talk about strategy, Ortega, feel free.
Oh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It would appear we'd had a bit of an IT malfunction, and it's not actually um, the end of the world. So hopefully, um, we're back on track, and you can hear me. I do apologise. It appears that the uh, the screen was not moving forward for some of you, which is uh, certainly not the outcome we wanted. So uh, the IT team have been in touch with me, and thank you very much, Kishore, for your wonderful help. It's, this wouldn't be possible without you, and therefore you're improving the quality of the experience. Just. Um, a bit of a recap then, so we'll keep moving forward. And if you do have any technical issues, please just fire them in the question panel and the IT team will be able to help. Um, so I was talking, and I was talking through, and you're probably sick of me now talking through, how to develop your points. Um, as I move along, just give me a little nod if you can see the screen moving, because I know that was the issue previously. You could hear me ramble on, but you probably couldn't see what I was talking about. Um, the PEC approach, so point, expand, comment, and a nice bit of visualization. You make your point, which you identify your key issue within the case. You expand by explaining why it is an issue, and then you comment, whereby you link it back to the scenario. I was given examples uh, whereby the train station didn't have ticket barriers. This would lead to an increase in passengers not paying for tickets, and as a result, this fraud would cause significant reductions in revenue. I then showed you how I'd want to see it in your answer with a nice subheading saying passengers without tickets and then a, set, a couple of sentences. So what have you got? One, two, three sentences in continuous prose expanded to give you the answer. Um, so now we're back up and running. I won't sort of ring this, this process out too much longer uh, and we'll get stuck into the requirement three. So I can see most people were back on board and I can see the question panel. So thank you, everyone. Uh, yay, now I can see. Wonderful. Uh, Furkan, Kirsten, Leanne, wonderful. Um, we're back. We're back on board and we're up and running. I also went through uh, a PEC, the so what approach, uh, when talking around another issue, which was Sealand and ANR having invested in an online booking system, whereas Realco had not. This was an issue, the comment, because it would hamper the long term performance of the business. And then I would represent this with a nice subheading, so lack of investment in online booking systems, and then written in continuous prose underneath. Uh, I would go on to talk about how my PEC fits in in terms of answering the requirements. So I'm glad that's uh, been useful for you. I've seen in the question panel that it has been. I'm now going to talk now more about requirement three. So requirement three in your real curve specimen paper two um, is pushing forward with the timeline. So it's now two months after the letter, so after requirement two, and the NAA chairperson of the trust board, uh, and you are a non-executive chairperson of an ad hoc subcommittee constituted by the nomination and corporate governance of Real Curve Trust Board. This actually is my favorite requirement because you get to decide on the, the actual credentials of two potential chief executives. Uh, as a consequence of the NAA review and the recommendations of the Railco Trust Board, the Ministry of Transport recommended that the chief executive of Railco should be removed from his position. Okay, So we've fired uh, John Rose, which is unfortunate, but necessary. Following the termination of the chief executive's contract, the position has now been advertised both nationally and internationally, and a person specifically has been up, or personal specification has been uploaded to Railco's website. In the last two weeks, two candidates have been shortlisted for final interviews, and a summary of their CVs has been reviewed by the Nomination and Corporate Governance Committee of Railco. So this is where we start to take a look at Exhibit 5. Required following the review, of the suitability of the shortlisted candidates against the outline specification, you have been asked by the chair of the NCG to do the following. Write a report, fantastic. So it's telling you what to do. That is the format that we would expect you to produce. To the chair, so there's your audience, so it's going to a senior individual within the business, which evaluates the suitability. So remember we talked yesterday about an evaluation. It doesn't want to be a one-sided argument. It wants to have some points which show that you can balance your argument and balance your understanding. It doesn't necessarily need to be of equal weighting, but certainly that you can constitute and understand two sides. So, which evaluates the suitability of the shortlisted candidates for the position of chief executive of Railco 
boom, there's an and in the middle of requirement 3A. So therefore, you've got a second part. Recommend with justifications which candidate you consider to be the most suitable for the position. I tell you what, if you got to do this at work, wouldn't it be very fun? You get to look at CVs for who's going to be the chief executive and you get to assess them against the specification criteria, so the job spec. And then you get to give your recommendation on who to hire. In doing so, you need to demonstrate commercial acumen uh, in using your judgment to evaluate the relative merits of the two candidates. So with the commercial acumen skill, you need to actually show that you can show or you can illustrate that you have a good understanding and good comprehension of what a chief executive should be doing. And you're considering the wider context of the case so not just necessarily looking at one specific exhibit you're now bringing in some of your knowledge from the previous exhibits as well and the overall scenario and what's going on in terms of maybe the performance of the business part b again this is why question three is my favorite one prepare two presentation slides how many two you wouldn't be amazed how many students produce three or one but yet it told you produce two with accompanying notes, so it tells you want you to write the notes as well. To explain to the NCG the contribution which the chief executive should be expected to make in terms of talent management to support the necessary change program required at Railco. You are giving two professional marks for communication skills in conveying relevant information in an appropriate term. So in a professional context, and guess what? In two slides, prioritized with a few points on each and the appropriate note format underneath. In fact, it's very much like making this PowerPoint. Effective reading and planning. So now when you're reading the exhibits and you're reading exhibit five specifically, you know what you're looking for. You're looking at the job spec and you're looking at the suitability of the candidates, candidate A and candidate B. You're also gonna work through this in terms of quite pragmatically breaking it down. So what I'd be doing when I've got this in front of me is I'd be writing all over this exhibit and I'd be putting maybe little ticks or stars against the things that are very important and key. So if we look at the experience that is required, the knowledge, skills and abilities and the personal qualities. So the job spec, the personal specification has been broken down into three areas. The experience uh, and the first point is that they should be working uh, consistently at a chief executive level. Uh, number two, they must work within a complex political environment. Number three, have a proven track record and specifically implementing cultural change because we know that the culture at Railco has not been the most forthright and the most important issue given that they had John Rose previously who would have had a detrimental effect to the culture so we need to find somebody who can implement cultural change and we also need to find somebody with the experience of building professional credibility with many different stakeholders and here we've got the board employees public sector and the media so that's your necessary experience the knowledge skills and abilities uh, the first one, a comprehensive understanding of the rail industry and the, in a political context, because bear in mind, Railco is a public sector organisation which is funded by taxpayers and therefore the public are a significant stakeholder in this individual case. Number two, have good leadership skills, in fact, well-developed leadership skills and be able to give, promote and positive and motivate cultural organisations or organisational culture, should I say. The next two, an ability to develop relationships with all stakeholders and a good financial and commercial awareness with strong analytical skills and problem solving. In the green, we've got the personal qualities, an ability to deliver under pressure, commitment to developing employees, a commitment to service excellence, which is strategically important for this business, given it's a service driven industry in the real industry, real care and lead from the front an honest and straightforward style which gains the respect of others. So you've given a little thought to what you're looking for, and in doing so, you'll be going through these CVs and Exhibit 5, and it's quite nicely broken down into professional experience, so that matches up to the job spec, experiences and duties, and then key skills and competencies. So what I would like you to do 
for the next three minutes, so what's that? In 180 seconds, is go through these two CVs and try and find the good and maybe not the. No, I'm not going to say bad because neither of the candidates are bad. And remember, you're doing an evaluation. So the good points for each one, and then come to some form of conclusion in yourselves as to which candidate is the most appropriate. And that will form the basis for your answer plan and the basis for how you're going to go forward writing up your answer. So what time is it now? It is 31 minutes past. I'm going to say, yeah, three minutes will be enough time to just have a quick read through these two CVs and find out what's good about each of them. And in doing so, tell me what you think is good about candidate A and tell me what you think is good about candidate B and maybe give you recommendation as well in the question box. So in fact, it's gone a minute, so I'm going to come back in at 35 minutes past. While I'm having a little read through the uh, question panel, I can see that John, uh, John, yes, your understanding of the PEC approach or the PEC approach is really good. Uh, Yolanda, I'm glad that you appreciate it. Um, I'm hoping that it can be one of your areas that you become extremely competent at. Sanjeev, yes, we'll have a look at question 3B um, in due course, my friend. So have a go at 3A to start with. So 3A is simply asking which of these two candidates do you think would make a good chief executive? But in doing so, you can't just give the recommendation outright. You've got to evaluate the good points of both, which one's most suitable, and then give a recommendation. So if you could do that for me, that would be amazing. Uh, and just Pop, pop your, your answer plan and a few key points in the question panel, and that'll really help to engage as we go along. Cheers. work coming in on there um, I can see what have we got here so we've got um, Erica really good in, in, in sort of figuring out which candidate I'm not going to reveal to anyone yet um, but hopefully everybody can make their own assertions uh, Erica you're absolutely on on the money uh, Furkan thank you very much
Nasir, well done, my friend. I like the fact you've made your recommendation. What I'd like to see is your rationale for that. So if you want to expand upon it, because your, your recommendation is absolutely perfect, and I know we're just discussing it in a format, what we can do on this platform. But if you could maybe chuck a couple of little bits in there as to why you think it's that particular candidate, and maybe, even more difficultly, think about why not the other one. Hussnein Mahmood, wonderful. Yeah, change leadership is a very important aspect here. Falcon, wonderful. Erica, outstanding. So Erica's talked about why um, one of the candidates is possibly less suitable than the other, although highlighted their key strengths as well. So it's showing that Erica understands the term evaluation and really gives me a lot of confidence that you're able to do so. Yeah, some really good answers coming in here. Uh, Hassan, Hussein Mahmood, right? I think I'm going to come back in because I, I'm I'm actually going to say so far this is probably one of the best best answers in terms of the best questions that I've seen you guys engage with. So lots coming in the question panel. If I haven't read it out, I do apologise, but pretty much everyone's got got the same conclusion as as what I have. Um, and if you haven't, then, then let's see how we go about this. So if I go back through this now, I've had to split the CVs in half. So I'm pulling out what I see as important factors. So candidate A has chief executive experience um, of JPS Express, which is a large passenger rail service in an operating country called Jaland, and is currently there. And has also got chief executive experience of Beeland Oil, which is a multinational oil and gas company for nine years. So if I was going to say that's a good thing because it's ticking the box in terms of the experience requirements. So that's a positive. Um, Developed strategic strategy and missions. Um, responsible for all aspects of human performance and enterprise human talent development. Uh, several complex systems infrastructure investments, uh, which is something that would come in really and useful in a rail company. Close liaison with national government regulators and rail interest groups. That's important, um, given the, the stress and the necessity of having good stakeholder management. And regular liaison with external suppliers, the media and the public, and given Railco's current issue with the media and subsequently the public as a result of, you know, the Beeland Herald's negative publication that we've already read, this guy seems, or this, this person seems very appropriate. But having said that, candidate B's got some fantastic possibilities. So currently a chief executive of the world's third largest engineering manufacturer of aviation industry. Based in Sealand, which is a, a country which is actually being compared to Beeland already when we were doing the performance analysis, and was the finance director of Sealand Rail for around three years. So there we go. That's not a bad thing. Um, but does it meet the, the job spec? Just glancing through, it's not as good a fit, but it's still not bad. Other good things around candidate B, responsible for driving growth of revenue and increased operational efficiencies. Now, in my opinion, that's something that Rilke really does need, given the fact that their revenue is not growing in line with their um, ticket costs. And they have significant cost implications and cost issues from a, a magnitude of cost control issues. So maybe the barriers, uh, lack of investment in IT as well. Can identify skill gaps, uh, providing advice on hiring strategies, but maybe not uh, at such a higher level as candidate A. Uh, liaising with key strategic suppliers and customers. So it's got stakeholder management, but again, slightly at a more uh, operational level. 
good understanding of budget expenditure and motivating and providing strong leadership to all departments. So this is where I then pull out the bits that I like. So I'm put the ticks next to it because they're all good things. But what I'm going to do is going to try and sort of identify the two key bits at the beginning of these series that make me think candidate A or make me lean towards candidate A. I believe that candidate A, A even, candidate A, <laughs> I'm definitely not a horse, candidate A has better or more appropriate even chief executive experience. I also believe that because candidate A has regularly liaised with external supplies, the media and the public, that is also a significant advantage of candidate A over candidate B. So if I look at this now, I say that candidate A has the two stars where we talk about the chief executive experience probably being the most effective comparative to candidate B. So they probably have better levels of chief executive experience, given that they work in uh, Jailand for a JPS Express, which is a train operating company and has also worked in oil and gas previously. And the key one at the bottom there regularly is on with external suppliers, the media and the public. This would be a significant um, advantage candidate A has over candidate B. But that doesn't mean he's out of the race or they're out of the race. We've also got some other positives in terms of competencies and key skills, all the while trying to match this back to the job spec. So candidate A has a focus on strong internal controls, customer focus and driving improvements. Ooh, change leadership. Fantastic and has been involved in the successful privatization of a company known as V-Train, it's interesting. A charismatic leader with successful track record in managing cultural change from the public sector. Oh, we do need some culture change um, at Railco. Uh, again, more about relationships and a highly effective leader, but we're not writing off candidate B either. Candidate B has the ability to network and the ears with stakeholders at every level, particularly customers and strategic suppliers a strong experience in project management, uh, has a track record in successful leadership, good interpersonal skills, highly commercial and operationally strong uh, financial awareness and commercially astute. I think for candidate A though, this is where they pip candidate B, the change leadership and the public sector experience. So I suppose the next thing is, is how would I show this in my answer plan. So what I would like you to do is to plan an answer, maybe using a couple of subheadings and a structure that you feel appropriate. So we readdress the requirement, write a report to the chair of the NCG, which evaluates the suitability of the shortlisted candidates for the position of chief executive of Railco and recommends with justification which candidate you consider to be the most suitable for that position. So I would like to see if you know what a report format looks like and then the key headings that you would put in it. So feel free to throw that into the question box. I'm going to give you just a couple of minutes to have a think around that. I do apologize. I'll uh, dismiss my notifications. Um, so I have a few minutes just to think around that. So what does a report format look like? And if you don't know, don't worry, it'll all be revealed shortly. And how would you structure your answer plan? Burkan, wonderful. Yep, so we've got a good structure there. Uh, well done.
Yeah, so what I would like to see in your answer plan is a few sections. So I would like to see your report format, which many of you have got right. So it would be report to, from, date, subject, introduction, and then subsections. So I would probably start with a section around maybe the personal specification and the criteria set out by the board. And then I would have two other sections. I would have candidate A as one subheading and explain how candidate A and evaluate how candidate A was, was actually appropriate. And then I would have candidate B as another part of the answer plan. And I would explain all the good things and the maybe not so good things about candidate B. And then I would have a last section, which is the final part of the requirement, which is, yes, either a conclusion or a recommendation. Thank you, Erica. So, Yolanda, that's insightful. Erica, fantastic. Um, let's see how I've gone about laying mine out. Um, hopefully, you can still see the screen. So, I've split mine over two pages for the, for the purposes of the presentation. So, I've got report to the chair of the NCG from the chair of a subcommittee, the date, and just for an administrative overview, um, the date in your exam will be the date of your exam, which is the 3rd of December 2019, unless you are strictly told otherwise in terms of a date. I often just say that the date of the exam is fine. The subject is a review of the candidates for the chief executive of Railco, and your introduction introduces what the report's all about. So you could have words to the effect of, in this report, I will be looking at the two candidates for the selection of the chief executive of Railco and giving my recommendations to the chair of the NCG. First section, personal specification, which is set out clear criteria for what you're looking for. So your experience, knowledge, skills and abilities and personal qualities, well, these were given to you in the actual exhibit. So you're not going to copy them out word by word, but you are going to structure them so you're telling the chair of the NCG what you are looking for. So I would have some form of structure there where I would talk about the experience needing to be chief executive level of a similar company, knowledge, skills and abilities around the real industry, in the political environment with key strategic stakeholder management skills, and then I would talk about the personal qualities, for example, being able to deliver under pressure. What you're doing is you're reporting to the chairman what you are assessing the, the recommendation of the, chair, of, of the chief executive against. <coughs> Excuse me. Candidate A would be my next subheading, and I would talk about their experience at chief executive level since 2000. So that's 16 years of solid chief executive experience working for an oil company and an express train company. I would then pull out the fact that they've got public sector experience, strong stakeholder relationship management, and have dealt with external bodies, and also maybe the fact that they deal with the media and the public as well. Candidate A also has change leadership and human performance management advantages and a focus on strong internal controls. The next section of my report would be candidate B. I would state not currently working within the real industry at chief executive level. However, they have previously for Sealand, currently is at a large aviation organization and has excellent financial management skills. So this is where you're evaluating. Although they haven't necessarily got all the experience at chief executive level that we're looking for, you are still giving the positives of the individual. So they've got strong financial management, focused on revenue growth and operational efficiencies, however, has limited evidence of managing stakeholder relationships or change management. So that's where your evaluation comes in. You're giving a trying to sort of look at the opposite side of the spectrum here. Uh, everybody in the question panel recommended candidate A, which is fine, but the recommendation in itself gets you zero marks. It's a recommendation with a justification. So the reason that I chose candidate A, and most likely the reason you all chose candidate A, was that this individual had public sector experience, had worked with complex stakeholders, and changed leadership skills. So hopefully you have a good understanding of how you would structure that report. So it would be to, from, date, subject, introduction, subsections, so a little bit about the job spec, 
candidate A, candidate B, and then a recommendation. And for that, you would pick up literally all of the marks. How do marks are spread out from a marking guide point of view? Up to one mark for each relevant point, which clearly evaluates each shortlisted candidate. Award up to two marks for a clearly justified recommendation. So only eight marks available, and then two for commercial acumen. To get two commercial acumen marks, the candidate has demonstrated excellent commercial acumen using the personal specification to form a clear judgment of the requirements of the role. The candidate has demonstrated strong awareness of the factors impacting on the successful contribution of a new chief executive and has made sound judgments on the choice of candidate. This leads me now to wrap up and finish my answer plan and my talk through question 3A. But before I do that, I'm just going to see how everybody's getting on and if anybody's raised any concerns, which they haven't, um, which I'll take as a, as a positive. So what we've got so far is that we've got the conclusion, Erica, thank you, Yolanda, John, uh, Furkan, Nasir. All this input is really good. Atega, thank you, Ishmael. Absolutely fantastic, uh, Aisha as well. Um, I really thank you for being engaging. The next part now is question or requirement 3B. So to go back to it and just to split it up, um, we've got you know 14.4 minutes, so we'll round that down. 14 minutes to deal with an eight mark requirement, which wants you to draw up two presentation slides. This would be a gift in your exam. Uh, I know that one individual wanted me to expand upon what to do here. So I'm going to give you a template within the plan as well. Prepare two slides. So if you get this type of requirement, the plan can be done and the answer pretty much hand in hand. You want to take your sword. And if you're thinking, hang on a minute, what are you talking about? I'm talking about your ruler. You need to take your ruler, draw a, a presentation slide box on your answer page, your answer booklet. So maybe take up half a page doing that. And then underneath, you want to write the subheading notes, underline it, and then put your notes underneath there as well. What you're talking about, well, the first slide, we'll want to talk about talent and maybe the term talent management in there as well. In fact, definitely the term talent management in there. And then write the notes underneath there as well. And then the second slide, um, also, this one wants to talk about the contribution of the chief executive in talent management. So for you to successfully answer this, you need to understand what talent management is. And if you don't, then actually just use some form of your educated guess. And I don't often say that, but maybe a, a common sense approach of an understanding of what talent is. And maybe why it's important to manage that talent. So, for example, progression planning within an organization of individuals who are ACCA students. And then the second slide, to support the necessary change program um, required within RailCo, you want to talk about the contribution that a chief executive makes. And you need to consider who the chief executive is within an organization, which is very much a talisman for a business which tends to attract strong talent. This is the template, in fact, so this is, this is an answer plan that I'm requesting you to do, and this is the template I would expect. So slide one, talent, talent management, and notes underneath. And I will give you a minute or two, in fact, I'll give you five minutes to do both parts of this. So slide one is talent and talent management, and slide two is the contribution that the chief executive makes. So have a little go at doing an answer plan for that, and then when I get back, which will be in five minutes, and I'll talk as well as we go through, we'll discuss it in some more detail. As you are doing your answer plan, I'm going to have a look in the question panel. I can see Sonika's questions. Let me just take a second to read it.
So Sanika's question is very appropriate, and I get asked this a lot. Um, how can we know in the exam how many marks will be allocated and how many points are required? And it genuinely comes from a lots of practice, Sanika. So if we look at the previous requirement, well, well, we've got that to hand, so 3A, you got, uh, let me just find this, uh, up to one mark for each relevant point, which clearly evaluates the shortlisted candidates, and you could be awarded up to two marks for a clearly justified recommendation. You will understand how the mark allocations work by doing more and more practice and taking a note um, within the ACCA resources and also the approved, approved um, start that again, the approved learning partners, so maybe your, your Kaplans or your BPPs or your first intuitions, their exam kits also show you how the mark allocations are split. Thank you, Sanika. Have a go at part B. So part B, draw out the slides on your answer plus. I'm hoping you've got a bit of paper to hand. If you haven't, you know, just draft up a few points. Um, so make sure that you're talking about what you'd put in slides, in the slides themselves, and then we can have a discussion around the notes as well. Um, I truly believe this question, question 3A, is a wonderful, very appropriate professional type question. Uh, the sort of thing that you'd be expected to do within a leadership position, which is to uh, look at the appointment of chief executives or the appointment of any individual, so the recruitment, and also give presentations as well. Monsieur, fantastic. Yeah, talent management to attract, retain, and motivate staff. By all means, I'd like to see that on your slide. Yolanda, fantastic. Again, yeah, your slide one and the comments you've put in the question panel are very relevant. Snane, you're on absolutely along the right lines as well, talking about long term objectives talented individuals um, and the management of these through recruiting, retaining, motivating uh, and deploying the personnel uh, which are required in these areas. Uh, Nasir is asking, which is a perfectly legitimate question, um, for question part B, 3B, and the later part of that requirement where it says, to support the necessary change program required at Realco, Nasir is asking what type of change is it talking about? Well, in all honesty, it's going to be the change in terms of bringing in a new chief executive. So bringing in a new chief executive will instigate the necessity of change in terms of organisational culture. And you've got to think about it from a big point of view. So currently, or previously, should I say, because the timeline's evolved, the last two months, we got rid of our chief executive, John Rose. And then when we get the new chief executive, we're going to need to change the culture of the organisation. We're going to need to change some of the understandings within it. So therefore, you need to actually have a chief executive who can manage the current talent, but also attract new talent to companies like Railco. This year, I hope that's helped. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Yolanda. Yolanda's popping in a meeting, so I uh, hope your meeting goes well, Yolanda, and we'll see you in 20 minutes. Kennedy, wonderful. Yeah, talent, motivate employees, allowing, supporting, uh, allocating tasks, fantastic. So you've got a good understanding of talent management 
and uh, Ishmael, wonderful again. Um, I'm not seeing anything incorrect, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, and you do sometimes in the chat panels, you get people who are very brave and sometimes they might get things wrong, which I do actively encourage because we learn from our mistakes. I'm now going to talk through my answer plan. And as we go through it, um, give me a shout if you want me to elaborate on anything. So just before we do that, um, hopefully I can go back to this. Prepare two slides. Again, I just want to emphasize that it's two slides. And I know it sounds a little bit condescending. I do not mean it to sound condescending. Uh, I just want to reiterate that many students, when I've set this question before and left them to their own devices, will produce one slide or three slides. And in that instance, we'll score very lowly. Um, two slides with accompanying notes. And many students, in fact, you might have seen in one of the examiner's reports when a similar requirement was set, they either did slides or notes uh, or neither. So it's important that you do take a ruler in to draw out the slides and it's important that you put the notes underneath. So accompanying notes to explain to the NCG the contribution which a chief executive should be expected to make in terms of talent management to support the necessary change program required in real code. Slide one, talent. The natural aptitude or skill which can contribute to the organization's performance and talent management, and many of you were saying words along this and you'd have got the marks, to attract, identify, develop, engage, retain, deploy the valuable employees, which is critical to real care. Within the notes, as I move down the slide, talented individuals make an impact on the performance of the company. This should be of the utmost importance to Railco, an attempt to turn around its performance. Talent management should be a key part of the organizational strategy and the development program to coach, network and develop talented employees to make sure that the staff are effectively trained and motivated. There's your notes underneath. And you would score many, many marks for this. In fact, if you do get slides and a presentation in your exam, I hope you sit there with a smile. Slide two, the contribution of the chief exec in terms of talent management. And on the slide, I want to see comments along the lines of lead from the top, because it's the chief executive's job to set the turn of the organization and therefore their leadership style and how they deal with talented employees is extremely important. They should also have buy-in from senior management, so that second point. Senior management must assess the talent needs um, for a change program, so therefore when they bring in the new chief executive, they're also probably going to bring in some more people or train up the people they've got at Railco. And it's the chief executive officer who is the driving force in attracting talent and building a high-performing workplace. The notes underneath, the chief executive must lead senior management team to understand that talent management is key in the change program at Railco. So when you do get a new chief executive, they will want to bring in their own people or develop the good people they have at Railco already. Visibility at senior level support or the visibility of senior level support is critical. So for people to be motivated and also for them to stay within the organization, it is important that senior management buy into a change management and talent management program. Because otherwise people will just think, well, I'm going to leave because I'm not going anywhere. I'm not progressing. The ability to attract external talent, external talent depends on the brand of Railco, which is very much focused and centered around the chief executive. So the chief executive is the driving force, integral in creating the employer brand, which will attract talent. If you think about organizations within the world, um, and I'll just think of several different chief executives. So maybe you might automatically think about, I don't know, Virgin and Richard Branson how he's a very sort of charismatic leader and how people want to work for that organization or maybe how Steve Jobs was also a charismatic leader and how people wanted to work for Apple and I'm sure there's many individuals within your organizations where you look up the hierarchy or maybe you are that person within your organization which does attract people to come and work with you or for that business. At this point I'm going to now look at the marking guide. So you get up to three marks per slide, which is very nice. So make sure you do slides uh, and notes. Up to one mark for each relevant point relating to the impact of talent management in the change required by Railco. 
Remember, you've got communication skills. So a poor candidate would have been one, quite frankly, who wouldn't have set this up in an appropriate format. So I've, you can see the little red dot. The answer is not communicated in an appropriate format. In other words, they didn't do it in slides or turn. So it isn't set as if it's for a non-executive director of the nomination committee. It's maybe set in slang words or abbreviations. So try and keep as professional as you can. As we move up the Likert scale, we go to the two marks, which is what you hopefully all would have achieved. The candidate has demonstrated excellent communication skills. The presentation slides and the notes were correctly and effectively structured, covering all key issues needed by the nomination committee to explain the contribution of talent management expected of the new chief executive officer. Now, personally, I think I've said this a few times, but I will say it again. I really liked requirement three. Uh, I'd be interested to know if you did. So actually, why not do a quick question there? How did you find that? Did you like requirement three? Would you think that it would take the allotted time? I'm just going to do a quick calculation. So what was that? And I do apologize. I've not got my calculator to hand. That serves me right. So all in all, you would have had 32 minutes for the 18 marks for the entire. Um, oh, Elon Musk has popped up in the safe. Fantastic. He is a charismatic leader. Um, 32 minutes you would have got for question three, requirement three. Um, do you think you'd have been able to do it in a quicker amount of time? Or do you think you might have struggled? Uh, I'd like your feedback on requirement three, please, in the question panel. Nasir, uh, I've got that straight away. Thank you very much. Yeah, most people are saying they actually quite like that requirement. Did anybody dislike it? Um, but you're more than entitled to. I suppose what I'm asking really is, would you like that question or that style of question in your exam? Cheers, Paul. Thank you. Oh, Farouk. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Um, I laughed because I read the first part and I was a little bit like, oh, no. Uh, for the benefit of everyone, uh, Furkan even said, I do not, I did not like it. I loved it. So, I mean, that's a, that's a fantastic bit of feedback from my side. Um, um, Husnain, I, I really like that question. So Husnain Mahmood has said, how can we be sure about the headings in the slide? And I suppose I was very kind to you when setting the, the sort of, I gave you those headings. So what I will do now is just flick back to the requirement and try and show you. So I would always use the requirement and the guidance of the requirement to ensure that that's the structure of your answer. So if we go back to the requirement, um, so prepare two presentation slides with accompanying notes on the contribution of the chief exec. So I would have that as one of the headings, which we did. And then also because it talks in terms of talent management, which is the subject area within the actual syllabus, I would also expect you to, to pick that up and use talent management and talent as a heading. Now, I appreciate it's easy for me to say that because obviously I've studied this immensely. But if you get a question and we will look at, um, I believe there is another requirement. Yes. So we are looking at some more slides um, over the next two evenings, so Thursday and Friday, and I'll try and make a point of where you get your headings from. And this isn't just headings in terms of the slides. So if we just put a pin in that for one second and we think about how we get our headings generally, we use the requirement to guide us because what you're effectively doing is writing a heading, a subheading in any of your answer, whether it's in a slide, whether it's in a report, whether it's in a briefing note, whether it's in a, um, a public statement. The headings want to be generally pulled from the requirement because then you are guiding the marker. So they're looking for a section on chief exec and a section on talent management. And in other questions, if we just flick back, uh, so if I go back to this one, they're looking within this one, a report format. So that can be one of your headings. They'll be looking for the suitability and an evaluation of the candidates. So you want to probably give some headings around the candidate A, candidate B. And then they're also saying consider the, the person with a justification and recommendation. So another heading which says recommendation. So generally across the board, every single one of your headings can be formatted and taken from the requirement itself.
moving forward and before I do that, yeah, there we go, back to 3B. I'm just gonna have a look and see how everyone else is comment on it. So generally everyone's quite positive. So many people are positive. Um, uh, a few people are coming on now, the bullet points. So how, first of all, how do you find the headings? Uh, the headings are pulled from the requirement. The bullet points are effectively reversed engineered from what your notes want to be. So your notes are written underneath it in continuous prose. And what I would say is that it might be worth having a quick look at the answer for this one if you're still a little bit hazy. So the full answer um, for this one in the uh, specimen paper two, which you will hopefully have as it's a handout, um, because that does give you quite a good um, understanding of how the notes are written. They are very brief, and to some extent, they're still quite large, given the uh, model answers are always a little bit overly long. Uh, John, do we need to put notes in bullet points? I would advocate no. I would write the bullet point. I would write the notes in continuous prose in sentences underneath. Um, Ashan, yes, you um, you've, you've stating that you maybe find it quite difficult, but a professional um, skill here is to be able to prioritise as well. So therefore, you should know which points are to be. Uh, the most important and therefore which ones want to be on the slides. Thank you, Ishan. Right, guys, um, it is probably a natural pause and um, I'm going to carry, Aisha, thank you very much. Keep throwing in anything in the question panel. I'm going to take a natural break. So I've got around 13 minutes past eight, so we will open uh, Word up. And it is uh, 8.13, and we will come back in 15 minutes. So let's say 28 past, let's <laughs> start that again. Uh, 28, let's make that a bit bigger so you can all see it. So we're going to take 15 minutes now, so we'll have a comfort break. And uh, keep throwing any questions you've got in the question panel. And when we get back, uh, we'll do a Kahoot. So this gives you enough reason to come back. We'll do a Kahoot. For anybody who hasn't done a Kahoot yet, so maybe you weren't on last night's session, you need to go on to Kahoot, K-A-H-O-O-T dot I-T, and then we'll have a bit of fun when we get back to make sure you're all still awake. See you in uh, 15 minutes, and I'll round that extra minute up because I've carried on talking.
Great folks, just uh, five more minutes. So um, if you are if you are still online, fantastic. I've not ran away. Just five more minutes, and then we'll get back to going through our presentation and doing a kahoot. See you soon. All right then folks, we'll kick back off. Um, before I get stuck back into the presentation, so I'll just press play. Um, I just wanna make sure that there's nothing I need to address in the question panel. All I can see is that Furkan is very excited for the Kahoot. Um, so what are we saying? Oh yeah, Nasir's put something very insightful. Um, Notes should be in the turn as the person explaining slides. So I think that's actually probably better than I could put it myself. Nasir, I hope you don't mind, I'm gonna steal that. 
Oh, I still probably a bit strong. I am going to use that and credit you in the future because you've really hit, hit the nail on the head. You are making a presentation and the notes underneath said slide want to be written in a turn as if somebody would be able to present from what you have given them. So thank you very much, Nasir. Um, so with no further ado, uh, let's get stuff back into here. So hopefully everyone can see my slide. Um, for those who weren't on last night, um, feel free to get involved this evening. Uh, for those who were involved last night, I hope you all still get involved because it was very fun um, and I've had lots of feedback, lots of positive feedback. So Kahoot is an interactive game, for those who haven't played it, which can be found on the uh, search engine of uh, your choosing. You just type in Kahoot, K-A-H, double O-T, and the website you want to go on is Kahoot.it. Uh, because that allows you to then engage into the game itself. I'll give you the game pin in a second. You can use your laptop or your computer. You can use your mobile phone or your tablet. You don't have to download the app, and hopefully your internet's quick enough. Um, when we get onto it, there is an array of questions, which I will read out, and then the colours, red, blue, we'll go orange and green, they correspond to the answers which are on the screen. So that's my uh, little introduction. Let's get stuck in and we will start. This is ACCA, SBL, Rail Co, prepared to or practice to pass evening three. We'll go with a classic game as always. And all you guys need to do is enter the pin into your device, which is 378843. DD's the first one in, which means that they're obviously very excited. Hassan, AA, oh wow, it's flying in. Uh, Furkan's in, wonderful. Hi, Jamie. Thank you, Cher. Uh, Tiga, we also got Yolanda. Cindy, thank you for joining in this evening. Uh, Nushad as well. Cheers, Dasu. Hi, Yait. SP, nice little acronym there. As accountants, we do love an acronym. Ismail's back in the building. Asan Aisha. <coughs> ET, extraterrestrial. I don't think that's what that stands for. Hi, Mavis. Uh, Kristen's in as well. I'll give you, I think we could probably get another five. Come on, last night we had over 50. Tider. Sandy Springs, we saw you last night as well. Great name. Come on. Uh, Kitty, it's not we lost one right then. Well, I'll tell you what, if the, the correlation is going to be going backwards, I won't be impressed. For anybody who isn't on, because they've got a little bit of technical difficulty, unknown, we'll go with that one. Uh, remember, the pin is 37. Double eight four three. You've got to enter that into the uh, into the app or into the, the actual website, and then you get access. Pop your name in, and you'll be able to enjoy the game as we go along. Um, right. Let's see how we get on. If you can't get on the app or you don't have access, feel free to just throw your answers into the question panel. And I'll review that at the end. Eleven questions this evening, and we'll start with true or false. Realco uh, are living up to their stated vision. So you might remember their stated vision, you might not. It was in the first of the exhibits, and you need to decide whether they are actually achieving their vision or not. And the 17 of you got it correct, is that it's false. They are not living up to their vision, and therefore they are not actually meeting the needs of the people they are serving. Uh, Furka, no wonder you wanted to play this. You're top of the leaderboard. DD, Hassan, and we've got two of these as well. So uh, this one's a quiz. What was the headline written by the Beeland Herald? Was it Rilke equals Gersler? John Rose has more thorns than flowers. Is Rilke going off the rails? Or ticket inspectors? You've got to hand it to them. Come on then, guys. We've got five seconds to go. Beautiful. 21 of you got it right. Yes. 
Uh, is Railco going off the rails was the name of the article written in the Beeland Herald. So well done for all the majority of you got that one. Um, Furkan still top of the leaderboard. Actually, top five look quite static. True or false? Philip Axes is an NED and the chair of the Audit and Risk Committee. I can hear you frantically flicking through the pages of the exhibits to try and find this one. It is indeed true. Yes, Philip Axes is a non-executive director and the chair of the Audit and Risk Committee. And that came as part of the information in your exhibits, specifically referenced in the exhibit where we had the board meeting minutes. So we've had a new leader. Uh, we've got Kristin. Fantastic. Well done there. Not much in it as well. Only 45 points between first and only 99 points between first and third. So we're doing really well. Close at the top. Uh, when considering the professional skill of communication, which of the following is important? An appropriate answer structure, the turn of your answer, covering all the relevant points or all of the above. Get your answer in quick. You score more points the faster you answer. Fantastic. 30 people have got in already. We've got five seconds to go. 23 went for all of the above, which technically would be the more correct answer, but I was being very nice. If you'd have gone for any of these, you would have got it correct. Let's just take a second to reflect on this. Professional skills of communication want you to structure your answer appropriately. So if they ask you to put it in a report, put it in a report. If they ask you to do pre two presentation slides with accompanying notes, make sure you do it. The turn of your answer, and we can be quite general with this. All of your answers want to be written in a professional manner avoiding any slang or maybe common foot, common, common, foot, common talk, um, whereby you would address your boss, client or colleagues, therefore your turn of your answer, and they cover all the relevant points and therefore you would be able to get the communication marks. Uh, Sakania, uh, Sakania, yeah, wonderful, top of the leaderboard, Hassan, uh, all in capitals in second, Sanika in third. So we'll keep moving forward. Um, up six places as well. We'll give ET the highest climber. So well done on that one. Question number five. The term fiduciary duty means that a director should act in good faith and in the best interests of the company. True or false? So this is a little tip of the hat. So one of the questions we looked at yesterday where they used the term fiduciary duty uh, in which John Rose would actually breached his fiduciary duty. Thirty one of you got it right. The highest percentage and the biggest majority of people went for true. A fiduciary duty is a direction of accountability whereby the director should act in good faith in the best interest of the company as the company technically is the principal and the director is the agent. Uh, Sakunina, oh, well done. Yeah, still on top. Hassan in second and Sanika in third. Uh, we're looking really good so far. So we're about halfway through now. According to the Higgs Report of 2003, what was the acronym that you can use to help remember the three key roles of a non-executive director? So in red, we've got the three E's, and then in blue, we've got SSRP. Oh, fantastic. I tell you what, that's encouraging. 29 of you went for SSRP. And I'll tell you what, if you can remember what that stands for, and I'm going to pause for effect, then even better. See, SSRP means strategy, scrutiny, risk, and people. They're the four key roles of a non-executive director. Whereas the three E's 
if many of you um, see that it's still got some relevance to the case, the three E's relate to value for money, and that is economy, effectiveness, and efficiency. But the one we were looking for in relation to NEDs was SSRP. Well done, the 29 of you. Ah, oh, fantastic stuff. True or false, when asked to evaluate, you should give only a one-sided argument. Right, then how did we get on with that one? Uh, bear with me one second, because I was just having a quick review of the question panel. Uh, looks like we are doing pretty well. So here we go. Uh, 29 of you got it right. Fantastic. So yes, it is false. When evaluating in any form, whether it's a professional mark allocation or whether it's the verb within the question, you would want to give um, two sides of the argument, not necessarily equally weighted, because in life, they are not always equally weighted. So, moving forward now, how's the leaderboard looking? Um, top five's remaining consistent. Uh, Kristin is making a comeback with three in a row. You are on fire, Kristin. I uh, hope not literally, but metaphorically speaking, that's always a positive. So, keep up the good work. Number eight, a report should be or should have which of the following? Two from date subject, introduction, sections with subheadings, or all of the above. Beautiful. Nobody got it wrong, which is always a positive. Uh, some of you jumped at the gun first off and went with two from date subject, which technically isn't correct, or which technically is correct, should I say. But you would have also got marks for answering any of this. Just wanted to reiterate that a report structure is two from date subject with an introduction, subheadings following section format, and therefore you would score the necessary communication marks if it was asking you for a report format. Well done, Sonika. You are on fire. A streak of eight correct answers in a row. And you are sitting very well in second position, uh, which is looking really good. So let's see how else we're getting on. A couple more questions to go. In relation to requirement 3A, which candidate was the most appropriate recommendation for the appointment as Rail Co's chief executive? This is just testing your short-term memory. We decided which candidate to appoint. Was it candidate A or candidate B? Three seconds to go if you haven't put answer in quick. Oh, come on, guys. Hey, have you went for candidate B? I'm hoping that was a slip of the finger. It would have been and is correct to state that candidate A was the most appropriate. The reasons why we're going to explore now. Sonika's on top, well done. Select any of the following which made candidate A a more appropriate than candidate B for the chief executive role at Railco. So in red, we've got public sector experience. In blue, we've got complex stakeholder management. In orange, we've got change leadership. And in green, we've got excellent knowledge of financial management. Select any of the following which make candidate A more appropriate. Yes, you could have gone for red, blue, or orange, but not green, because candidate A did have solid public sector experience, was able to complexly manage stakeholders or manage complex stakeholders, and had experience in change leadership, whereas candidate B was the one which specifically had excellent financial management knowledge. Only one of you went for green, which is very, very positive. So we are coming towards, I believe, the last question, uh, and it could be any of you. Hello, Leeds. Fantastic for making it into the top five. Let's see how we get on. And Tyda is making a comeback. You are on fire with three in a row. Last question. What approach should you take when developing your answer? Repeat the same point over and over again. PEC, 
rewrite the requirement onto the answer booklet, or superfluous waffle and brain dump. And uh, if anyone can see the, uh, there's a random Pokemon on your page actually, doing a, a nice sort of dance for you there. Two seconds to go, and the winner is, oh, well done, yes, 27 of you went for the correct answer, which is to peck, point, uh, expand, and comment. Two of you went for rewrite the requirement on your answer booklet. If I could, I would throw the stress ball I have in my hand at you, because that is certainly not what you need to do. Do not rewrite the requirement on the answer booklet. It is pointless. And also superfluous waffle and brain dump. I'm assuming that because it's green and it's underneath the blue, that was a slip of the finger. You certainly do not want to waffle. You want to be short and concise and to the point. So with 11 out of 11, all three of you doing very well. So Sonika got the gold because you were the fastest. Only marginally. Wow, is that? What's that? Nine points difference, Sonika. That's very, 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 very much down to probably your internet provider. So well done. Hassan, uh, to apologize in getting a silver medal. Uh, Nusad, well done also in getting bronze. What did the top five look like? Uh, Leeds there. Oh, I was rooting for you. I know I'm not meant to be biased, but I am. Uh, you came successfully in fourth and Nani in fifth. So hopefully you enjoyed that. Uh, hopefully it was a good way to get back on board with the presentation as well. And after a nice break, it helps to sort of re-energize. So we're going to move back into the presentation. You can hopefully see the screen, hear me, and we'll be moving along now into looking into requirement far off requirement four. Let's not get ahead of myself. Um, so let's get stuck back in. Requirement four then. So this is now progressing through a new timeline. I, I believe it's uh, three months later. So if I click through, yes, it is. It is now three months later. A new chief executive has been appointed and is working closely with the board of directors of the Real Code Trust Board to improve performance. Who are you? You are an internal auditor working for the Audit and Risk Committee of Real Code, and you want to be looking at a spreadsheet, which is Exhibit 6. The new chief executive asks the financial controller of Realco to produce a spreadsheet which analyzes the ticket sales and real usage by station within Beeland's real network and which also analyzes the estimated level of fraud occurring across the Realco network. What have you got to do? Well, you are required. You've been asked by the chair of the Audit and Risk Committee to review the findings of the financial controller and present a report. Okay, you're presenting a report, which requires you to do the following to, from, date, subject, introduction, subheadings. That's what your report wants to look like. Analyze the information. So there's your verb. Analyze is a quite a medium to high level verb. So you want to actually look beyond the numbers. Uh, presented in the spreadsheet, produced by the financial controller. But what type of analysis? Questioning. Questioning, and it's very good that your professional skill is also skepticism. So you need to be a little bit professionally skeptical in questioning any assumptions that he has made. So you've got an and in here as well. So as I talked to you about giving the structure to your answer, you also want to split this requirement because you also need to explain the implications of the findings for real curve. So when I look at this requirement, I'm thinking there's eight marks. I would probably want to do some form of analysis for up to six marks and two marks for an explanation to the implications of real curve. Uh, two marks for skepticism. So part A is to look at exhibit six and pull it apart, basically. Uh, you can look at it from a skeptical point of view, and in doing so, you are showing that you can analyze. But don't forget that you are giving an explanation at the end of part A is to the implications of the findings for real code. So what's the implications of the spreadsheet to real code in terms of the overall performance of the business? Part B, recommend to the audit and risk committee with justification. So recommendations are a relatively medium to high level verb as well. And justification, so you need to actually give a reasoning. So your peck could come in really well here, and I'm hoping that's resonating with you. Make your point, expand your point, and comment on it. 
Uh, make justifications with suitable measures or safeguards which could be implemented by Railco to reduce the levels of fraud occurring in the network. So the question, if you were to even simplify it some more, is simply asking, give recommendations and justify them on how you are going to reduce fraud. Eight marks, so maybe you're looking for around four things here. Uh, and you've also got to show commercial acumen skill. Now remember, commercial acumen skill is making a sound recommendation with appropriate judgments. So you want to now show that you have a good understanding of the business, its environment, and therefore in your commercial acumen skills, maybe give recommendations that are specific. If you can think back to your, um, and you, you know, I appreciate you might not have looked at everything and it's still absorbing in your head, but if you think back to the examiner's report and similar requirements to this whereby students are asked to give recommendations one of the key problems with many students when they give recommendations is they aren't specific enough and they're too vague so when you give your recommendations to pick up all the marks they want to be specifically related to the case and practical 20 marks 36 minutes very nice requirement Effective reading and planning. So we're going to be looking at exhibit six and we will now take a second to just breathe and be really happy because as accountants, we love spreadsheets, don't we? So let's take a look at what we've got here. And what I would like you guys to do is spend a bit of time and I'm going to talk as we do it, just really just absorb in this exhibit. Let me find my spotlight. Analysis of fraud and information based on a 2016 analysis. This is initial data on a station in region one of the Beeland network. What have we got across the tops of towns? Ticket barriers, yes or no? Population per town. Monthly tickets sold in the town. Estimated percentage of railway users per town. So it's a percentage figure. Estimated monthly ticket sales per town. A variance between tickets sold and projected ticket sales. Spend per ticket sold. Estimated fraud in Beeland dollars per month. Fraud as a percentage for each town based on total population. And I'm, I'm already seeing things here like, oh, look, these are significantly higher than these. I wonder why. I wonder what the reason could be. Um, and then we keep going down here. And as we go to the bottom, we've got this assumed percentage, assumed average percentage of unpreventable fraud, region one. I wonder how they've calculated that. We've then got estimated fraud due to poor internal controls based on total population. And then we've got preventable annual fraud in Beeland dollars based on total population. So these figures, 3.9, 7.4, 10.45, and 5.3, we add them up, we get 27 million billion dollars of preventable annual fraud, according to the financial controller, based on region one. Ooh, and then we've extrapolated it for 20 regions. So if I was to have my calculator to hand, which I do, because I am obviously prepared for the exam, I would times this figure here, by 20 and it spits out. Uh, we'll round it up, 200, uh, 200, uh, four, five, 543, wow, well done at rounding, Alex. 543 uh, million dollars of preventable fraud, according to the financial controller. And a note at the bottom, there is 20 identifiable regions within Beeland's passenger service network. For this analysis, assume all regions are similar in size and structure. Wow, wow, wow. So, yeah, there's a lot going on, there's lots of numbers, and there's a little bit of haziness from, from my perspective as to how on earth we get to these figures. But that's not what we're being asked. We aren't asking you as professionals to try and recalculate and re-engineer the spreadsheet, because if we were, well, we might as well do that on the Excel or spreadsheet software. What we are asking, if we go back, is to analyze the information prevented in, presented in the spreadsheet produced by the financial controller, questioning any assumptions. I am going to give you now five minutes to 
throw into the question panel all the assumptions that you wish to question. So if you think, you know, and I'm not going to give you many off the bat, but maybe some of the things I'd put the pointer towards might give you a bit of guidance. So I'd be looking at maybe four things here. So try and find four things that you don't like. Ooh, that's maybe a bit strong. That you would like to question. Imagine you could sit down with the financial controller and say, oh, have you noticed this? Uh, how have you come to this assumption? And is that is that reliable? Um, because you are showing whether you are sceptical or not. So do that for the next five minutes. I'll still be here. I just want to make sure you guys are engaging with the spreadsheet. Hopefully you've got it to hand. If you haven't, I will flick back to it now. There it is. And I'll pause my screen so it's able to stay there. As you do your analysis and you're questioning the assumptions, throw them in the question panel or jot them down and throw them in all in at the in the next five minutes. So as you are questioning some of the assumptions, please just pop them into the question box and I'll have a little look as well. Yeah, stuff flying in already. Um, I'm not going to fall a surprise, but not seeing anything incorrect as far some really good sort of causation correlative type answers in here um yeah really good really really good ortega yeah i like that point aisha as well if I can indeed yeah perfect It is outstanding work. Really good skepticism. Is that a question for me, or is that your assumption? Is that the question you'd ask your uh, financial controller? Because I'd ask that of the financial controller as well.
Yeah, if I can. Right. Um, just another 60 seconds because everything's really good in here. Lots of people are mentioning about which towns um, have ticket barriers versus done and how that links to the uh, percentage of fraud. Many of you are asking about is 20 really representative and the extrapolation, um, the phrase of unpreventable fraud. It's a hell of an assumption. How can we get to that presumption? Um, so we're going to work through this in a minute. I just want to make sure everyone's had a fair go at sort of thinking about what you'd like to ask the actual um, financial controller. Some of you are mentioning now about how have you estimated the monthly ticket sales? How have you arrived at that? You know, that's a that's an interesting question that I'd like to ask as well of the financial controller. See if we've got anything else in there. So guys, so far so good. Um, what else? Anybody have anything else? So right then, let's have a look at some of the assumptions that I pulled out of there. So if we take if we take the sort of pragmatic approach, and if I was doing an answer plan, I would probably have scribbled all over this. Um, and I'm going to try and show you it in a neater format of my scribble. So these are the things that I'm interested in. I'm going to start over on the left. Uh, I'm going to get my spotlight so you can see this. And I'm going to talk you through the type of things I'm questioning of the financial controller. So the assumptions um, around percentages are very valid, but this is where I'm going to start. Actually, one of my observations is that C, D, G and I do not have barriers. And as a result, their percentage of fraud is significantly higher than those which do. So if I was pecking, that would be my point. So C, D, G, and I have no barriers. Um, and then my expansion, uh, as a result, this has led to fraud percentage being considerably higher than that of A, B, E, F, H, J, who do have barriers. Um, and therefore, this is going to have a negative implication on the performance of said towns uh, in terms of cost control and revenue. I then want to move over and I want to talk a little bit about some of these figures. So if I go along the bottom here, this yellow one, and some of you have asked, how do you get to this 1.28%? Now, I would ask the financial controller that. And because I've had plenty of time to actually calculate this, now in your exam, you wouldn't. And therefore, you've got to use your own judgment and not get bogged down in the numbers. And one of the key risks with this type of requirement is that you spend far too long trying to reverse engineer all the numbers. Think about it from a high level. You want to look at this spreadsheet and sit effectively, sit with the financial controller in real life and just ask them some questions. Now, that 1.28% is all of these yellow figures added together. So these are the ones with barriers. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six added together and then divided by six. That comes to an assumed average percentage of unparental fraud of around 1.28%. We then get to our estimated fraud due to poor internal controls by taking 1.28% away from this figure here so 8 minus 1.28 gives us 6.7 or 6.72 so this is how we get to this figure now again you wouldn't be expected or nor would it be needed to reverse engineer this and i will stress that to you again this isn't a requirement which requires you to do the spreadsheet and reproduce it this is a requirement where you are asking what are the assumptions within this? So the first assumptions are around not barriers having more fraud. The next one you could even actually say to some extent having a barrier reduces fraud. And then you could keep moving forward. So where I've got this black dotted line, I have added these up. So we have got our preventable annual fraud and we've got 27 million of it, as I've said already. And then we've times it by 20 to get our 543 million dollars. 
$543 million is a significant amount of fraud. And I'm going to go into this green bit in a second because I'm still questioning the assumptions. The first thing I'm asking myself, and I'm going to ask the finance controller if I could, is that, is that surely reliable? And then I'll probably link it into this as well. There are 20 identifiable regions within Beeland's passenger service network. From the analysis, uh, we assume that all regions are a similar size and structure. That's a hell of assumption, and it's certainly not representative. So again, this is all the stuff that I'll be putting in my answer plan. The latter part of your answer asks you to talk about the ramifications, the consequences of this analysis by the finance controller on the performance or the, the on real curve generally. This is where the green part comes in. So if this is, let's just cast aside all of these assumptions, the reliability and the questions over it being representative. If it is, which it isn't, but you know we can use this from an arguments perspective. If we do have $543 million of preventable annual fraud. That is the equivalent to 13% of our revenue. Wow. 13% of our revenue from 2016. If you're wondering where we got that revenue figure from and how we calculated it, that was actually available to us in Exhibit 3, which was the passenger survey results and performance analysis. And you'll be able to see how we got back to the 13% as a proportion of that. So hopefully now you're thinking, oh, this is quite nice, actually. I didn't need to do loads of numbers, so that's all right. For those who are interested in the numbers, I'll talk you through them in a bit more detail, although for the purposes of answering your requirement, you didn't need to do this. So to figure out how we got over to the preventable annual fraud, and I'm going to do it based on town C, just for the purposes of illustration, because I know some students are going to and bound to ask how we got there. I will show you. We take the population per town, and so this figure here, in fact, I'll get the pointer again so you can see, the figure here, times it by the estimated uh, percentage of railway users, and then we minus our monthly tickets sold, which gives us a variance of 8,800 in this instance for town C. We then times that figure by the spend, which is effectively the price of tickets sold, which spits out our estimated fraud per month of 387,200. So that's how we get here. So the first part's relatively straightforward. If we just track the numbers back. And therefore we correlate here. The next part's a little bit more complicated, and it's not massively more complicated, so stick with me. The next part, we are now going to be working out how we get to this estimated fraud figure. So the estimated fraud figure of 6.72. So we take our population per town and we divide it by our variance, which gives us 8%, and then we deduct our fraud figure and the actual assumed average percentage. So that's how we get to the 6.72. We then take our estimated fraud per month, divide it by the percentage of fraud based on towns, based on total population, times that, so we gross it up, per the estimated fraud due to poor internal controls, and we get a roughly around 325248. We times that by 12, and that gives us the preventable annual fraud based on total population. And there is some rounding difference. And that gives us a 3.9 million for this particular town, town C. If you follow the process, you'll figure out that the figures correlate along as we go. Now, just to reiterate, you do not need to do that level of detail of analysis. I did that for the benefits of those students who like to know absolutely everything about that spreadsheet. For the purposes of this analysis, you needed to come at it from a high level. You need to come at it by questioning the assumptions of the finance controller and not doing their job for them. Just to look at the requirement once more. Um, I quite like this graphic, actually. So this might be some of you this evening with your pet next to you. Um, analyze the information presented in the spreadsheet produced by the finance controller. So we've done a bit of that. Questioning any assumptions they may have made and explain the implications to rail curve. It's in a report, so report to, from, date, subject, 
and introduction. So the subject analysis of fraud in Beeland's network and an introduction can be, you know, it doesn't have to be word for word exactly the same as this. In fact, it probably will not be. But where's the effect of this report analyzes the information on ticket sales and rail usage by station within Beeland Rail Network and evaluates the potential for passenger fraud and its impact on the revenue of rail cut. The analysis is based on the information in the spreadsheet that was produced by the financial controller pre-produced below. Now, your analysis, and it's just to stress again that for the purposes of your real exam, you would not be expected to reproduce this in your answer. Um, so I would not want to see, nor would I expect to see anybody rewriting the spreadsheet. Please do not waste your time. Do your figures and your answer plan on the exhibit itself and then structure your answer using subheadings under the section analysis. So many of these we've already ticked off. So we've said each station without a ticket barrier and you want to give the examples, has significantly higher levels of fraud than those with the ticket barriers. Therefore, assumes that ticket barriers have a direct impact in preventable fraud. So there's one assumption, and you would just definitely be picking up marks for talking about that. Moving forward, the spreadsheet, spreadsheet calculates over 27 million in total annual preventable fraud for Region 1. And then extrapolates this to 542, 543 million for all regions. I would then want to expand on this and say that this is probably not representative. And that is a questioning of an assumption of the financial control that you definitely need to put in there. Uh, the next one, the assumption that the region is perfectly representative of all other regions is very unlikely. Variables such as demographics, proportion of real uses, etc., vary greatly. Many of you talked about this, which was very good to see. If we move forward again, uh, if the assumptions are reasonable, the 542 and 543 million in fraud equates to roughly 13% of Railco's 2016 revenue. So, this is where I start to talk about the implications to Railco's performance. This is clearly a significant control problem. Unpreventable fraud is calculated at 1.28%, which is the average fraud for those stations with a barrier. This presumes that there is still fraud in the station with the barriers. So there's another presumption, another assumption. And there is always an element of fraud which is unpreventable. So that's my overall answer plan. Let's see how we would go about answering it in terms of the marking guide. So let's see the marking guide. Pull out my pointer. Up to one mark for each relevant point made relating to analysis of the findings of the spreadsheet, identifying levels of preventable fraud in region one, up to a maximum of six marks. So the first part of that sort of eight marks available was six marks for the assumptions and then the analysis of those assumptions. And then two marks were awarded for an evaluation of the implication on real cause revenue, which is the part whereby I did the extrapolation analysis in comparison to the revenue for 2016. Skepticism is considered if you are able to question the assumptions. So if you did not question the assumptions, you would score zero. Um, if we move on. So candidates have excellent demonstration of skepticism skills in effectively and accurately analyzing the information presented in the spreadsheet. The candidates have also demonstrated clear understanding of the real cause implications. You would get two marks for that. I'm going to be quite sort of transparent here. This two marks for transparency very much correlate, two marks for transparency, this two marks for skepticism very much corresponds with your ability to qualitatively, um, to give a quality answer. So if you do manage to question the assumptions and analyze them, you get your six marks. If your evaluation relates back to the revenues and therefore shows that you've read broadly in the exhibits, you are probably going to score very highly in terms of the professional marks here. What I would like to do now is go back to 4B. So 4B asks you to recommend to the Audit and Risk Committee, with justification, suitable measures or safeguards, 
which could be implemented by Railco to reduce the levels of fraud occurring on the network? I like this question. It's very practical. What you've got to do is think about the broader context of the case and how you, if you were able to be involved in the leadership of this organization, would look to reduce the fraud. You've got to make sure you can justify your point. So if you're going to give a recommendation, you've also got to be able to say why. Be specific. How would that help reduce fraud? And therefore, what I'm going to do now is let you guys have a go at planning and coming up with maybe, I don't know, how many, how many sort of things do you think we need there? Um, three or four recommendations. Three or four practical recommendations. I'm going to give you five minutes to do that. Uh, so I'll, I'll pop myself on mute. I want to see them pop up in the question panel and we will debrief them in the next five minutes. Don't worry, I'm not running away. I just want to make sure you guys are also engaging with the plan as well. So hopefully you come up with a few ideas. Um, think about how you would prevent or reduce fraud on the real current network, and maybe draw upon your experiences from reading the exhibits in the case study. Cheers, guys. I know we're digging in. It's getting late and we're three evenings into the P2P. So, you know, sometimes this sort of can get students quite lethargic, but you're doing a great job. Um, let's see what's coming in here already. Uh, there's some really good ones. And again, um, many students ask me sometimes, you know, I'm not sure where to start um, with some of these questions. And the truth is start with the obvious and many of you are doing that which is brilliant so one of the safeguards i've seen is to install ticket barriers and that would definitely pick up credit because of course you want to install ticket barriers there is a correlation between levels of fraud at stations which do have them uh, sorry do not have them so and the ones that do have them have significantly less fraud so that's going to be some form of safeguard i think that's going to score you marks it just depends how well you expand it maybe you want to Heck it.
One thing students tend to do on this requirement as well is sort of they get the first one or two points quite straightforward. These are the safeguards, but then they, they, they struggle to give another maybe three or four, which isn't necessarily the end of the world. If you do practically in your exam run out of ideas while doing a requirement like this, it may be that you just need to take a breather for 60 seconds or you maybe need to um, sort of reset yourself and therefore it doesn't hurt to move forward and, um, and go on to another requirement and leave room. So many students seem to forget that you can actually leave room within, the, um, within your exam script and it's perfectly not a problem to do that. So you could leave some white space, half a page below your answer, and then go forth and, and, and then come back to it later. Yeah, getting some more out of the box thinking now. So ticket barriers are there. I had a couple talk about staff training. Yeah, that's a, that's a good safeguard and definitely a measure to prevent fraud. Very practical. Ismail, yeah, um, embracing technology. I like your idea. Let me see you can peck that one. What do you mean? So make your point. That's your technology point. Expand upon it and then you comment. Why, why would that help? Sonique has come up with a very good one, very practical as well. Ticket inspectors, regularly inspect the tickets during the journey. Great stuff. How would that help reduce fraud? Lots of good ideas coming in, so thank you for everyone who did. Um, I can see all sorts of stuff here, so uh, Otega, uh, Erica, Aisha, thank you, Nasir, Gil, um, Nushad, Farhan, Ismail, Yolanda, Hussein, uh, Hussein um, Sanika, John, thank you very much for all your input, really, really useful. Um, and I'm going to sort of go back into the presentation now, so hopefully the screen's moving. And yeah, it is. <coughs> and talk about four that I pulled out. Now, as I said, these are practical, they are relevant to the case study, and they are specific. First one, and everybody thought about this install ticket barriers. Uh, clearly, ticket barriers reduce fraud, given the information in the case whereby you can see the significantly reduced fraud levels for those stations which do have ticket barriers. There would potentially need to do some form of cost benefit analysis to assess the need, but I would argue that is a logical thing to do. And there is an investment required as a result because ticket barriers will be some form of expenditure for the business, but they probably would benefit in the long run by having them. Um, let's go across to the right. Selling tickets on board trains, that would be an effective ticket, um, an effective safeguard because more tickets inspectors um, would be able to track the trains. Uh, it would be a, a relative cost, but maybe they could minimise that cost by only selling the tickets and only having more ticket inspectors maybe at peak times. Bottom left, expand ticket offices and employ more staff. This would help reduce waiting times. Frustrated customers would become more satisfied and the expansion of the booths equals probably some more tickets sold. Uh, bottom right, online ticket sales. Currently, Railco is behind the industry leaders. 
Conveniences, uh, I'm sorry, that again. It's convenient and encourages customers to buy tickets. And they would also potentially need to do some form of cost benefit analysis in order to implement the ticket sales online. But I again would argue that it is a necessity given the real cost situation. Well done, everybody. You did really well. Um, I am now just going to have a quick look at the marking guide. So if we have a look, you get up to three marks for each measure recommended and clearly justified with a maximum of eight. But if you went for four and you went for them quite briefly, you would probably get a two, 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 two and then get your eight marks that way. To get your two marks for commercial um, acumen, the candidate must show excellent judgment make recommendations of safeguards which are measured and demonstrate strong commercial awareness and understanding. In other words, be specific to the case, be practical, and also don't necessarily try and overcomplicate things. That brings me to the end of question four. So we've had a look at requirement 4A, requirement 4B. I actually quite like that requirement. I'd be interested in your feedback. So if I give you a minute at so, just to throw any questions in the question box, um, and I also get a chance to have a catch up as well. So I've seen uh, a few people saying they're very happy, which is very good to see, uh, and obviously shows that you are thinking along the right tracks. There was a pun intended, thinking along the right tracks. I'll take, a, I'll, I'll take my help to that one. Um, and I'm very happy to see this. So if you've got any requ questions around requirement four or generally around anything around structure, please do let me know. So uh, a couple of general questions in the box. Sharice, oh, you were late. I do apologize. You're asking what PEC means. What I'll do is I'll endeavor to do a little quick recap of the PEC approach at the end of the evening. So do stay on board. Uh, it's quite a simple process and um, hopefully you'll be able to engage with it. And then I've got a couple of people again asking about a WhatsApp group. And I think I've mentioned this every evening, but what I will say is due to GDPR restrictions, so data protection, uh, I am unable to create a WhatsApp group. So I can't do that, unfortunately, but it doesn't stop you guys doing it. Um, try and figure out a way of doing that. So Sharice is going, wants me to go into more detail. PEC stands for point. P, expand, E, and then C stands for comment. It's a way of building your answers and structuring your sentences to maximize your marks. So it looks like we're able to move forward again. Um, we're doing really well this evening, if you think about it, because last night we only did two requirements, and we've already done two requirements, and we've still got over half an hour to go. Uh, you're more than welcome, Sharice. So if I get stuck back in. Requirement five. Um, and if you can think back to session one, and you think about where students generally score not as well as you would expect or maybe the common mistakes they make. One of them is not getting to do this requirement because it's the last one or in more accurate terms, not doing it very well because they haven't managed their time effectively. Whereas this won't happen to you guys because you are going to be sticking to the 1.8 minutes per mark rule and using that for your writing time, which will equate to roughly 40 to 60 minutes of reading and planning time. And you are going to be flying through. So you will get to the end of your exam with at least 36 minutes to go to ensure you can dissect requirement five and have an absolute brilliant run at it. Who are you? Uh, you are the project manager uh, working for the directors of the project and infrastructure of Railco. Fantastic. So we know who you are, project manager. The project director is putting forward a proposal to the board of directors to invest in online ticket sales systems. We've seen it coming. And I tell you what, if you didn't leave enough time for this in the exam, you'd be absolutely gutted 
because it's such a lovely question that many students would score very well on it if they were able to spend the time on it because you know full well that they do need an online ticket system and you can justify it all the way up to you know all the way up to the maximum mark allocation in yellow the project should be fully operational within 12 months but you need to undertake an external firm of developers okay as Railco does not possess the internal expertise, that's fine. That's very normal within projects and project management. However, Railco would manage the project. Fine. Not a problem there. So all this sounds pretty normal, pretty standard. We're going to be looking at bringing in our online ticket sales system in the next 12 months, basically. And you are the project manager. The project director has asked you to write a business case. Now, that's an interesting format because many students get a little bit bamboozled by a business case. And we're going to have to take a second to address what that actually looks like. Uh, write a business case in which you will justify why the investment in the online ticket sales could assist Railco in producing detailed and timely customer data to assist in customer relationship management. You get two marks for evaluating. Now, let's just take a second and pause. A nice big deep breath. Overall, you get 10 marks for telling me why, and you already know why, why they should invest in online ticketing, but you are coming at it from a customer relationship management perspective. Now, many students, when I've done this question with them before, come at it from a pure performance related perspective. Oh, it will lead to more revenue as a result of reduction in fraud. It will lead to cost control as a result because we will be able to, you know, maximize our cost, cost structures. All that sort of stuff kind of not what the question is asking. And this is a stereotypical requirement where students read something like justify why an investment in something that they want to invest in, but don't actually answer the requirement set. The requirement set is saying, why would that investment help produce better quality data, so detailed and timely data, and how would that help our relationship management with our customers? How would that help us sell and give a better service to our customers? Number B, number B, no, letter B, wow, Alex, uh, 5B. Produce a PID, a project initiation document. So here's some project assumed knowledge. So you would have to know what a PID is. And again, this is a type of area in a syllabus where some students don't study it. Like, oh, I've studied P1 and P3 syllabus. I didn't bother to read anything about projects. Well, you should, uh, because naturally, projects are everywhere within an organization. And if you are a senior leader or even a senior manager within a business, the likelihood is you will be involved in projects. So understanding projects is something I'm going to spend some time on. Uh, I'm also going to spend a little bit of time talking in detail about PID. And I'm going to give you a bit of insight in how you could go about answering any project type question and focus on project constraints. To go back to 5B specifically, you need to make a project initiation document, which could be used by Railco to assist in the planning and the implementation of the online ticket sales system. You get two marks for communicating, which again, we have now learned means using the correct structure, the correct tone, and therefore understanding what a PID is, is very much essential to getting the correct communication skills. 20 marks times 1.8, 36 minutes, and away we would go. Effective reading and planning. But Alex, there isn't a specific exhibit that relates to this. No, there isn't. And it's quite nice because hopefully by now you've got a good understanding of the broad spectrum of issues within this case. And therefore you can draw upon your experience and, and supporting phrases and supporting understandings from any of the exhibits and any of the introduction. Specifically, if you've got a 10 marker, I don't know how I've got to that mathematics, um, that should say 18 minutes, well done Alex. 14.4, um, maybe that's the eight marks alone. Nevertheless, 10 marks in totality, 18 minutes. This is how we'd go about it. Business case for the investment in an online ticket sales system. 
for Railco. You would have an introduction. The following business case sets out how an investment in online ticket sales could assist or could assist Railco in producing more timely customer data and assist in CRM, customer relationship management. I would start your business case by explaining the current situation because you are trying to gain support for a change within the organization and a change in an implementation of an online system. A business case is effectively a document produced that's given to senior individuals within the business that tries to get them to get on board and support your change. So currently, there is no online ticket sales facility. Ticket offices are there at each station. There is inadequate ticket buying facilities and a lack of barriers, which has led to a high level of fraud. Industry leaders such as Sealand and ANR sell tickets online already and have a competitive advantage. This is now becoming a customer expectation. Some may even call this some form of um, you know, competency, which we expect. Uh, maybe a threshold competency. Sorry, my mind ran away from me there. I would like you guys now to think among yourselves individually, because obviously I don't think any of you are sat next to each other, unfortunately. And the next section of my business case will be for the benefits of an online ticket sales system. So I want you to come up with around three benefits. I want you to do that over the next 120 seconds. So I'm going to give you two minutes to think about the benefits of an online ticket sales system, but specifically think about the benefits of it in relation to customer relationship management and customer data. So I can see quite a few things coming into the uh, chat panel, but I want to just sort of give you a few more minutes. Uh, I'm going to um, I'm going to sort of go silent for about a minute or so, which is quite hard for me. Um, so I'll do that now. Keep them coming. Yeah, keep them coming, guys.
I'm just going to take a moment to have a read through and remember this question is asking how would the online ticket sales system benefit from the perspective of data and customer relationship management. So Nasia, uh, your first point is correct, but wouldn't score any marks. So for anybody who's writing in terms of, you know, ticket sales system would allow for an increased revenue is not what we're actually asking here. That doesn't answer the requirement. Yes, it would help the performance of the business, but it doesn't help, it doesn't answer why it would produce more detailed and timely customer data. Uh, and it doesn't ask, answer why it would help with customer relations management. That's a performance related answer. So putting things like it would help produce more revenue is not going to score you any marks. Uh, Sajid's hit the nail on the head. So things like identifying customer travel patterns, that's the sort of thing we're looking for here. Yeah, Farkan, again, a very nice valid point. More data, understanding the customer's buying patterns, which will help us actually increase their loyalty, if we're able to map to that is. Just reading through, there's a lot in here, so do bear with me. Yimita, um, you've put a practical answer, which is save queuing time, but that doesn't really answer the question either. How would an online ticket sales system help by producing detailed and timely customer data that will assist in CRM? Saving time queuing doesn't answer that. Yeah, a few people are linking it back to the mission of Yolanda. It's also assisting Realco with more efficient, reliable service in aligning the customer's mission. How does that help with data and CRM? And if you could link that back to maybe customer satisfaction, um, that could be good. Hosnain talking about cost efficiencies. It's also a key benefit of online ticketing is correct, but wouldn't score you any marks. It's not answering the question. Furkan talking about a loyalty program. Fantastic. Yep, that's you've hit them. You've kind of get in the gist of it. So loyalty programs, things like that would link back to CRM. And then you would talk about how that loyalty program is going to be effective. Well done. Oh, that's a nice one. Um, John, uh, John, I, I, you're offline, so I can't, I can't, I don't know if I should respond, but I will nevertheless. John, your point needs to be linking back to data. Um, so make sure you emphasize the need for using the online ticket sales system from a data perspective and how we can tailor all that extra data to make our customer relationship better. I want you to think about it now from a broader perspective. So if we think about a business which captures your data and maybe you do this within your organizations and maybe you've seen this happen. So you may buy something online um, I know I do this and I do it through very, very many online retail outlets. So whether it's a clothing outlet or whether it's a, um, an online outlet where I buy electronics from or even some online outlets where I buy insurances and services from. They keep my data and then they tailor their marketing and their customer relationship management to what I have bought previously and my purchasing patterns. That's the sort of thing we're thinking now. And I remember people were talking in, I think it was day one or day two, about big data. 
this is somewhat a little touch, a little tip of the hat to big data and the fact that having more data allows you to understand customers if you can analyze it and mine it effectively. Let's have a look at what my answer plan would look like and thank you for everyone who's engaged so far. So we've again, business case for the investment, an introduction and then a little understanding of the current situation. The benefits of an online ticket sales facility. CRM builds relationships, which will help with customer acquisition, retention, and loyalty. Realco could utilize this to become more customer focused. They certainly need to. Effective CRM can be profitable as Realco customers need retaining, improves customer satisfaction with online ticketing, and therefore also increases loyalty. Electronic CRM through the internet will help support the customers with pre-sale information, for example, timetables, can be more interactive with the customers and allows for a quicker flow of information. Given this is a business case document, there would also need to be some form of risk assessment. Now, there will need to be a cost benefit analysis, given that they need to assess the financial viability of implementing this. We would also need to look at the risks, the specific risks, including change of customer perception. They might not be willing to actually buy online. They will. They, de they definitely will. But, you know, we need to consider that in our answer. There may be resistance to the buying habits. There is always resistance to change. And therefore, there may also be a lack of awareness. But we can overcome these risks with adequate customer awareness strategies, advertising, and a marketing campaign. So that's part A. You get up to one mark for relevant points made in relation to the impact of an online ticket sales on customer relationship management, CRM, not overall performance. You get two marks, we'll just focus straight down here, for evaluation skills in that the candidate has demonstrated excellent evaluation skills. This has clearly demonstrated excellent professional judgment in assessing the impact on timely customer data and CRM. The candidates have also demonstrated a clear ability to assess the impact of a new system on the stakeholders of Railco. I think I've done my math again wrong here. If we move forward into requirement 5B, produce a PID. Um, I know where I've gone wrong. Effectively, what I've done is I've done, uh, you know, in fact, yeah, 14.4 is 8 times 1.8. So you get 18 minutes for this full requirement. Ignore my silly maths. Um, and if we move into what a PID looks like. So in a project initiation document, you would actually score your marks by knowing what should be in there. And it can be anything ranging from project objectives, project benefits, scope and deliverables. And I'm going to move forward and come back constraints, key stakeholders, project team roles, risk assessment, cost estimates, and then performance measures. So you can actually lay your, um, your answer out in a PID because a PID is a reference document that would be used from a brief point of view. So it can be laid out in a tabular format. And the project objective in this instance is to implement an online ticket sales system in Realco to enable customers to purchase tickets online as well as through ticket sales offices and train stations. The overall objective of the project is to increase customer satisfaction levels. Some of the benefits that would come as a result of this, a reduction in the numbers of passengers traveling without tickets, improved revenues and profitability, increased levels of customer satisfaction and loyalty. Up to the minute customer data and marketing for marketing purposes, reduced marketing costs due to online advertising and tailored marketing approach, meaning a more tangible focus on customers' needs. Any of these benefits, fantastic. The scope, the actual breadth of the project. So what does the actual project need to entail? So an extension of the customer website to include web-based ticketing, booking technology, and customer contact facilities. A customer database to capture customer information and a booking history, which can be utilized for customer relationship management and marketing purposes. Deliverables, funding. 
to be considered as a part of an overall cost benefit analysis to be completed. Resources. The project will need to be undertaken by an external systems development provider. The tender process will need to be carried out immediately. Time. To produce, uh, the time of the product or the project should be completed and the booking system should be fully operational within 12 months. If we move to the next slide. So other sections of a PID. Constraints, funding, resources and time. And I'm going to spend some time talking about project constraints. So I'll be a little bit brief here, move forward. Key stakeholders, the customers, the fair paying passengers, the staff and the trained staff of the rail co, the board of directors, the trust board and the government of Beeland. Project team roles, we have a project manager, a development team, a rail co director of infrastructure and projects and infrastructure and one NMD. Risk assessment, there will potentially be cost overruns, delays in the project, a lack of customer usage or satisfaction system and potentially system security breaches. You could also, within your PID, talk about cost estimates, which are to be undertaken, and then performance measures. And it's perfectly legitimate to write this in your exam because you are taking a professional understanding that you may not have done that estimate just yet. Um, I would like to now just move forward, because I might have lost a few of you and try and give you some advice in terms of projects overall, because naturally some people do find this element of the syllabus a little bit less engaging, to put it politely. Um, the marking guide, let's get this one just nailed down, uh, a maximum of two marks for each relevant aspect of the PID from an online ticketing sales system and project, you would get two marks for putting it in a PID format. But let's just say, we have a problem. We have a problem in the exam because we didn't study projects properly. Uh, or we've not seen that element of the syllabus and gone into grave amounts of detail. And this is genuinely, from my experience, an area of the syllabus that many students don't engage with as much as they should. So I'm going to give you a bit of insight into how I get my students to remember the project life cycle, what happens in the project life cycle, and then the key project constraints, which will allow you to attack, one for a better expression, have a go at any project related question. And I hope you find this useful. So the project life cycle I have illustrated along the top, and it has five distinct stages. We've got initiation, plan, Implementation and control are actually together because you don't do them independently. So I've looped them together here. And then completion. Well, if I could spell it, completion. Nevertheless, it should say completion. Underneath initiation, I've wrote the term feasibility because this is where you would be asking yourself, should we, could we, and can we? do this particular project and to do that you want to look at your toes so have a look down at your feet maybe you're not wearing socks maybe you've got sandals on and maybe you're wearing flip-flops have a look at your toes you want to look at the project from a technical point of view uh, in other words can we do it do we have the technical understanding um, and in this instance in real if we link it back to the case and just put the question to a side they said they do not have the technical expertise, but they can contract it in. So do not discount that immediately. They're going to get an expert contracted in. So technical is from an expertise point of view. Operationally, the O of your toes. Um, do, do we have the ability to be able to do this? Do we have the time? Um, do we have some of the operational resources? Um, and in this instance, again, we're going to manage the project. So we could argue that we do have some of the operations. E, the E of your terms of feasibility. Uh, economically, can we afford it? We need to do a cost benefit analysis still, but that is something we would consider at the initiation stage of your project. Lastly, and certainly not least, socially. You might as well exchange that S to stakeholders. What do our stakeholders think of us trying to do an online ticketing sales system project? Is it a good thing? Who are the key stakeholders? Do we need to do any stakeholder analysis? And therefore, 
we would assess feasibility on these four criteria, technical, operational, economical, and social slash stakeholders. If we draw our attention to the top line, and then we'll go down in a second, we've got the plan stage. Now, when you are doing your plan, you may also still be engaging by doing some form of project initiation document. So your PID is the reference document that you have just seen and been asked to produce in requirement 5B. And realistically, your plan is a form of risk analysis and risk management, so identifying risks, assessing those risks based on impact and likelihood, mapping those risks and coming up with contingency plans and then monitoring the risks. So you would look at the risks, maybe your constraints within your um, project. And a SWOT, strengths, weaknesses and opportunities and threats, they can also form part of your plan. Strengths from an operational, technical, economical and social point of view and so on and so forth. The PID, this point here about a reference document is something that you want to consider because it isn't something that is just done at the plan and initiation which is done in between here it's kind of an interlink it's then used at pretty much all of the stages of the project life cycle so you could potentially use the PID as a reference document when implementing and controlling so milestones are a form of implementation and control and these are the key points um, the key dates within your project so they've got a milestone of 12 months but within that they may have individual milestones on every month at stages of development of the online ticketing system gates are in addition to milestones we see these more often than not in construction contracts or production and manufacturing whereby we have a project which means that we cannot move forward a gate we cannot pass through the control gate without completing everything that needs to be done prior to that. The analogy I often give is building a house. You wouldn't be able to continue to build a house and put the roof on unless the foundations were built first. We may then do some form of corrective action by doing some variance analysis. And that variance analysis could be against costs or projective incomes of the project. So variances are another form of control and they're done as well as within the implementation. Moving along the project life cycle, initiation plan, implementation and control. Oh, excuse me, I went far, put it back. There's my pointer. We have the completion phase. So we complete our project. We would want to do a post completion review, which is effectively a post completion audit, whereby we would look at whether or not at the end of our project did we meet all of our targets all of our references that we set out for the initiation and planning at the onset of the project. So this is my project life cycle diagram and how it links into a PID. The next slide, which I've kind of already given you, are our project constraints. These are the six key project constraints. And if you can remember these, you'll probably be able to have a good answer at most project related questions because we have time, cost, quality, resource, risk and scope. I'm just pausing for effect realistically. Time, cost, quality, resource, risk and scope. A time is something in terms of uh, maybe the, the, the 12 months that was in relation to this particular project, the time scale. Cost would be a cost benefit analysis and that still needed to be completed, but you could put that in your PID. Quality is the quality of the output. We wanted an online ticket sales system that would allow us to sell tickets online, produce customer information, so therefore we can inform the, the customers of timetables, for example, give a better quality customer service, and then use that information to tailor our marketing through customer relationship management. Resource, this is another project constraint. The resource could be financial, it could be operational, it could be technical, or it could be, for some examples, social. We need to consider those resources. Do we have what it takes to actually successfully complete it? And in this instance, we're bringing in external consultants. 
The risks, we've already done a little bit of risk analysis. The customers might not like it. They might not actually take it up. And how are we going to manage that risk? Um, well, we're going to implement advertising. And then the last one, scope, which again, we've seen already, which is the broad spectrum of things within the actual project. So how broad, how far reaching is our project? The arrows effectively represent one thing. And this is that if you are asked about any stage of the project life cycle, so, and I know I've not got it all on one page, but we've got implementation, plan, no, we've not. We've got initiation, plan, implementation and control, and then we've got completion. You could use these six headings to discuss any of the aspects within a project scenario. And you could use these six headings to plan out your PID, time, cost, quality, resource, risk and scope, and you would pick up the vast majority of the marks in doing so. Which brings me quite succinctly and quite nicely towards the end of Realco, actually perfectly timed. Um, I'm just going to have a sort of a, a look if there's anything in the question panel that I need to address urgently. And then I'll do my close. John, just to add um, to your question, so he's asking, how can I get these slides? Um, they are literally in the resources now. They are the updated version in the resource slides now. So if you've got the handouts and you click on them, they should be the updated version. So it will have everything in here, John. And that's for everybody as well. So for um, the last one, uh, no problem, Ebby. Uh, just to sort of close off this evening, um, We've got five questions that we've gone through. The first one was on agency and non-executive directors. Uh, question two was on performance analysis and internal controls. Question three was on the chief executive and talent management. What a wonderful question that was. We got to look at CVs and decide who we wanted to employ and then do a presentation on talent management. That was good. Question four, we did some analysis of a spreadsheet produced by a financial controller. So there was a little bit of internal audit work there. Uh, fraud and risk and then the safeguards. And then question five was in relation to data, customer relationship management and projects. We are now at the end of evening three. So thank you very much for your engagement. I've had a fun evening. Um, I'm glad you've sort of giving me some positive feedback as well. Tomorrow, tomorrow, we will be going through highlights. So December 2018 um, is the exam. It was a real exam published then and the students sat it in December 2018. It's about a hotel, a budget hotel chain. Just like with Realco, I would like you to read the scenario, case study, exhibits and requirements if you can get the time. And we will do uh, an exam walkthrough of that tomorrow. Thank you very much, ladies and gents. Um, I'm hoping that um, if you if you need anything, you've chucked it in. Um, so yeah, I, I, we've, we're at the end. And if you need anything in the question panel, I'm not running off for the next few minutes. So thank you very much. Lovely to see, see you all in inverted commas. And I look forward to speaking with you all tomorrow if there's nothing else.